All right, let's uh, let's get started. I'm going to share my screen, and you should be sharing my screen now. And here we go. So, I'm not going to be uh, going through all the you know what's new in DXO uh, Nick version two because that you should have seen the previous webinar on that. And if you didn't, um, essentially what we're looking at in brief are a bunch of new presets, compatibility or inclusion rather of the um, of uh, Photo Lab, sorry, of uh, Photo Lab with the collection and uh, some upgrades for Windows users specifically with the interface. Um, but the main thing that we're gonna start with is Photo Lab itself. So it comes with this Photo Lab that's called the Essentials Edition. That's what we're working in right here. The difference between Essentials and the main edition is primarily the prime noise reduction. That's the one big thing that is missing from this edition. Uh, but we're gonna be working in here in, in its entirety today because I want to do a workflow demo for you that does not require any third-party apps. And this is an important part of what we're looking at today. If you have used the Nick plugins in the past, then you know that you needed another app to use them. Mainly for most people, that would be Photoshop or Lightroom, um, or you may have had hooks into them from other apps, but that was kind of the primary way to use it. And of course, for a lot of people, especially now that Adobe has a subscription-based service, a lot of people don't really want to spend money every month using their services. So what DxO is now offering is inclusion of Photolab with the Net Collection, which means you no longer have to have any other software. You can use just the tools that you get in the box here. So that's where we're gonna be working today. And I'm gonna start with this photo here, which is a lovely little landscape photo that many of you are looking at going, why is it so purple? Well, cause I screwed up the white balance. Honestly, I don't know why the white balance is so off. I think maybe I had a custom white balance set for something else. I honestly don't know, but that clearly is the first thing we're gonna fix. So very simple thing to do inside of Photolab, which incidentally, if you've never seen Photolab before, very, very brief tour here. On the left-hand side, if I click on the photo library, I am browsing my hard drive. The photo library in, in Photolab is not a separate database. It is not like Lightroom where you import things into it. You are simply looking at your hard drive. You can look at any folder of pictures anywhere on your hard drive, on an attached drive, on a network drive, doesn't matter. It, wherever it is, you can just, if you can see it in the finder, you can see it in Photolab. And anything that you do to a photo in Photolab is gonna be saved as an instruction set. There's gonna be a little metadata file that, that gets created next to that photo. Those instructions are the instructions for what you have done in the app, in the software. It is, of course, totally non-destructive. So anything that I do to a raw file is not overriding the file. It is just saving the instruction set. Now, if you create a TIFF or a JPEG or anything like that, then you are creating a new file that has all those changes baked into it. But anything you do in Photolab itself is always, always non-destructive. Even if you're playing with a JPEG or a TIFF, all the, all the changes are saved as a metadata sidecar file. When we go into the Customize tab, this is where we get into all the adjustments on here. And you see we have a histogram, which actually by default is over here on the right-hand side, but one of the kind of cool things about this interface is I can rearrange things the way that I like. I'm working on a relatively low-resolution screen right now just for the purposes of this web webinar, so it's easier for you to see what's on my screen. So I don't have a whole lot of room here. I'm going to be moving things around a lot, but on your screen, if you have a bigger screen, the histogram on the right might be fine, but for me, I like putting it over here on the left. You have a navigator tool, exif data, there's presets in here, and then on the right-hand side, all of the controls that you have. And you have all of your standard exposure adjustments and highlight recovery and curves and levels and, and distortion correction and a lot of stuff that you are used to finding in photo editing apps and a lot of things that you might not be used to finding. Um, I'm not gonna, again, give you a full tour of everything that's in here. I'm just gonna start using it. So the first thing I'm gonna do is change the white balance. So I go to the white balance tool here and uh, I, there's presets in here, right? So it's this was a cloudy kind of overcast day. So I'm going to um, going to assume that maybe a, a white balance of sorry, I'm just checking the questions, make sure I'm not nothing's going wrong here. There we go. Um, I'm going to assume that a white balance preset of cloudy day or overcast is going to work. So I'll try that. I go in here and I go cloudy, and yeah, it's a bit too warm, I think, for my tastes. Um, let's see what shade looks like and and it's basically the same. So yeah, they're both too warm, so I'm just gonna do a manual. We'll just pull the manual adjustment down a little bit. It's just, just a little bit there. Okay, I like that, I think that's good. Okay, so now looking at this photo, it looks relatively flat, right? This is a pretty flat scene. And for me as a photographer, when I took this picture, 
it, I saw this flatness, but I saw more. I saw more depth to it that I'm not seeing in here. And truth be told, when I took this photo, I was out with a friend of mine who's a professional landscape photographer. And it was one of these scenes where I'm looking at it going, I want it to be beautiful. I think it's beautiful, but I, I'm just, it's not quite registering in my head. And then he started pointing things out to me. He goes, well, look at the, the shadows versus the highlights in here. Look at how this area of the trees is quite a bit darker than this up here. How this area is darker than this here. And it's really kind of hard to see but it is there, but we're not, that's not really translating in here. So for me, the best tool in any editing app is curves. And with curves, I can very quickly pull those shadows down, pull the highlights up, separate those two and make this a much higher contrast, much more interesting image. So in here, we have this thing called tone curve. There's your curves. And all I'm going to do is a simple, draw a simple S curve. I'm just going to take my shadows and pull them down on my highlights and pull them up. And very quickly, I get this much more dramatic image that looks way cooler. So now we're off to the races. Now this is looking pretty good. Uh, maybe it's a little bit oversaturated. So I might want to pull that down a little bit. Uh, let's see, I think that's under, not color rendering, where's the saturation? Um, where's saturation? I forget. You know, you use these things every day and then you forget where the tools are. It's not selective tone, contrast. Nope, we're going to go into that later. I think, <laughs> oh, here it is. Hue and saturation, good grief. All right, let's pull the saturation down just a little bit. It's a little bit too rich. Okay, cool. So now I've got the contrast looking good, but if we look closely into the shadows back here on the tree, you'll see this area here is, is almost completely black. I right, pulled the shadows down so much that I've lost basically all detail in there. So what I wanna do is fix that using local adjustments. Now, any tool you've used before, whether it be Photoshop or Lightroom or Capture One or anything, you always have tools like your dodging and burning brushes, or maybe you have radial gradient type brushes where you have a, a gradient area, linear or radial gradient area where you can make that brighter or darker, or do whatever you want to do. We have those in here. However, inside of Photolab, there's something else that is really, really special. And this is actually technology that comes from the Nick plugins. So just a little bit of back history here, if you aren't super familiar with the whole history of Nick plugins, the Nick plugins have been around for something like 15 years. The original company was Nick Software. Nick Software sold to uh, Google a while ago, and then most recently DxO bought it from Google. And inside of the Nick plugins has always been one of the crowning jewel pieces of technology, something called U-points. And U-points are automated masks that are built automatically, instantaneously, based off of the, the color and the, um, uh, the brightness of wherever you click. So when I drop a U-point onto that dark tree there, it is only going to affect the dark tree. It's remarkable, let me show you exactly how this works. So first I go up to local adjustments here, and within the local adjustments interface, um, if I right click anywhere on the screen, I'm gonna get this little pop-up tool selector, and it gives me different types of tools to work with. So there's your graduated filter, just that gradient if you want that. A standard brush, if you wanna do standard traditional brushing. You've also got brushing with uh, edge detection, it's called auto mask, so you can use that as well. But the really cool thing is right here, this control point or U point. The names are kind of used interchangeably, but and I might use both throughout this presentation, but this is a control point. I just uh, drop it anywhere, just click to drop it down. And you have two, two things here you can do. You can change the size, the sphere of influence. Now, it is only going to affect things that look like the area that I clicked on. And don't worry, I'll show you exactly what's going to be affected. Um, but it's only going to collect, uh, adjust things that are, that are based off of that area that I clicked on. And again, only inside of that sphere. So if I wanted to affect all of the dark trees in the image, I would expand it out really big. If I only wanted to affect that one basic tree trunk there, I would make it smaller like this. Now to see exactly what's going to be affected, remember I haven't done anything yet. I haven't brightened or darkened it yet. All I've done is drop the control point on there. I can click this button down here that says show masks. And when I do that, it switches to a mask view so I can see precisely what will be affected. And here we can very clearly see that only the darkest part of that tree is going to be affected here. Awesome, that's what I want. So let's go over here to exposure, take the exposure slider, drag that up a little bit, and you can see that it is bringing up the exposure on that tree without bringing up the exposure of everything else around it. If I'd gone in there with a brush, I would have that affecting the whole area. Even if I went in there with a brush with masking tools, still, you know, sometimes you use this auto mask and it's like there's a little bit of a halo, there's a little edge in there that you know, didn't quite get right. This gets it perfect every time. And it's a remarkable, remarkable tool. So we've got that. So I've just brightened that up in there. Um, 
yeah, so that's looking pretty good. I'm going to do a little bit of very, very minor retouching. It's now I, I'll be honest with you, the retouching tools inside of PhotoLive are pretty basic. They're not really advanced, but they are here. And for simple things, they work pretty well. So for example, in here, I will go and uh, get rid of this branch. It's just kind of distracting. If I zoom back out, this branch there is distracting. That one there is distracting. So I'm just going to get rid of those real quick. I'm just going to go in here and grab the little eraser and give it a moment to, to calculate itself. Here we go. I can adjust the size of my eraser brush with the slider here, and, and maybe that's a little bit too small. And then I'm just going to kind of run over that line. So you're basically painting over the area you want to remove, let go, give it a second to calculate, and it does it. And it did a, not the greatest job there, but let's paint that again. And I think that'll do it. Yeah, that's good enough. And then I'll do the other one up here. And I'm just doing this because visually it's distracting to me, and I just want to kind of clean that up a little bit. So. You have the basic tools in there. It's also good for blemishes. I'm going to do a portrait later. We'll get rid of a couple of spots on there. Okay, so that's good. That's that's good enough. Um, and now I've got an image that is looking really great. So now at this point, I want to take this into the first Nick plugin. Now, the Nick collection plugin uh, plugins has a lot of variety of them. You have corrective tools and you have creative tools. I'm going to be focusing today on the creative tools because those are the most fun ones. Those are the ones that I use on a regular basis. And the first one that I'm going to use is called Color Effects Pro. Now, someone asked in the previous uh, webinar that I did, so I'll answer the question now in case somebody else has it. Viveza is also a color tool. Viveza is more color correction, where Color Effects Pro is more color creative. So that's the, the separation, the differentiation that you have in there. Also, if you've never seen this, this new interface here, this is the plugin selector that is part of PhotoLab. You do have a settings button here, so you can choose how you're going to send the file off to Nick. Now, it's important to understand that the NIC tools do not handle raw files. That's part of what you're doing inside of PhotoLab is you're doing your raw processing. At this stage, I have to hand off a TIFF or a JPEG. I'm going to do a TIFF. I don't know why you'd ever do a JPEG, but I'm going to hand off that TIFF to the NIC plugins. And I can choose from here whether I want that to be an 8 or a 16-bit TIFF. I'm going to choose 16 just to make sure that I have the most latitude possible. And this is the default setting. You don't ever have to go into there, but if you do, that's what you're going to find. So I'll hit Color Effects Pro, and while that's rendering, I'll see if I can answer any of the first questions. Paul Newton says, uh, can you import photos like Lightroom? Does it organize your photos? So no, there is no import. There is no import interface inside of PhotoLab. If you're going to shoot some pictures on your digital camera and you want to bring them into PhotoLab, you would simply in the Finder copy them from the card to a folder, or you could use some other tool that does the importing uh, if you wanted to, but all you have to do is copy them in, and then you're just pointing PhotoLab at that folder. Kevin Shoulder, do these act like luminosity masks as well as a layer mask? I'm assuming you're talking about the control points. It's, it is closer to a luminosity mask than anything else. It is based off of the color values and the luminance values. So the chrominance and luminance to be more technically sp uh, specific about it. So it is kind of like a luminosity mask in that way. It's not exactly a luminosity mask. That is a little bit of a different thing still, uh, but uh, that would be the closest association. Okay, we'll come back to more questions later. Um, let's get started here. So I am going to start with presets on the left-hand side here under recipes. These are my new presets, and I'm in the Unvogue category, which is my new presets for this app and or for uh, for this plugin. And I want to just click through the different presets to see what they look like. So like here's one called Blue Monday, which honestly I think is really really cool. It's a completely different look, but it's really nice. The colors look really interesting and nice in here. Okay. So that's an option, you know, maybe I'll use that one. Now let's go through some others. Uh, clarity bump in here. Well, clarity is, is that kind of localized contrast, that really fine, deal con uh, fine detail contrast. That looks pretty good in here, but it's kind of flattened it out. I don't know if I really like that. Um, even on a cloudy day, looks kind of cool. Those greens are really poppy and saturated. Foliage bump, okay, well, it has definitely bumped up all the foliage. It is looking crazy green in here. Probably a little bit too much for my taste, but you know, that's cool. It's, it's there for another photo. HDR like has, lifted the shadows, pulled down the highlights. It's kind of the opposite direction of where I want to go. It's made it more flat, which I'm not a fan of. Um, this lavender ones, adding a little bit of a lavender cast to it, red rocks, enhancing the red a little bit, just, just different ones to play with. And the one I'm going to use here is called Soft Mute. I think this one is really, really pretty here. Now, if you saw the original webinar that I did, I used this same preset. I'm, it's not a one-trick pony, I promise. I just think that it looks really, really good for this particular photo. Now, if you've never seen these plugins before and you're wondering what is actually happening as I'm clicking on all those presets, over on the right-hand side, you'll see all the effects that are being applied. So the way that the ColorFX Pro works is if I click on the filter library, these are all the filters that I have 
to select from in here. Over on the right hand side, you see the filters that are currently added. So as I go back into the recipes, if I click on any other recipe, the entire filter stack gets swapped out. It's something different. That's that recipe, um, preset recipe, same thing. If I choose the one that I had before, soft mute, everything gets replaced over here. At any point, I can add or remove any of the components of this recipe. So this one's using three filters, duplex, classical soft focus, and infrared film. I could simply click on add filter here and it's gonna add a filter holder. And then I go over to the filter library and I choose which one I wanna use. But for now, we're just gonna use the one as it is. And I know that the soft focus filter is where this kind of soft focus is coming from. And it's got this really kind of dreamy look to it that I really, really like. It makes for kind of a fairy forest kind of a situation, almost like a little bit of a misty, foggy day. Um, but there's a strength slider here too, and I can take that up and I'm just gonna crank it all the way up to see what happens and it gets way overdone, definitely overdone in there. So that's the beauty of it, right? I can go in here and I can start playing with it and find a setting that looks good. And, you know, I just, I like it. I really like it. It's maybe not for everybody, but I think for this particular photo, it looks beautiful. And if I wanna do a side by side, I can click on this preview. This will show me a split screen preview. So you can see the before and after, you really see that difference, or I can do a side-by-side -side here as well. And there you really see what's happening. And again, I think it's particularly pretty. So um, I think, let me check my notes. I don't think I'm gonna do anything else to this actually. Um, yeah, just a little bit of a, a playing with the softness in there and, and we're gonna call it a day for that one. So I'm gonna hit save on this. It's gonna render this TIFF out and drop it back into the folder next to where the raw file was. So we're actually gonna see this photo as a TIFF file showing up down here in the browser. Because remember, we're just looking at a folder on my hard drive. So there's the original raw and there's the new one. So if you wanna do a little before and after on those, you can see the original to the affected image. Now let's say I wanna try something else completely different. Well, remember that raw file is still there. The raw file still has all the adjustments that I did to it. I can go in here and make other changes inside of Photolab, totally non-destructive, or I can say, no, no, this is a good starting point. I just wanna try something completely different. So that's what I'll do. Go back into Knit Collection, and I'm going to once again hit the Color Effects Pro button. Now it is gonna say, hey, you already have a file named this. Do you wanna overwrite it? I don't in this case. I don't wanna lose what I just did. So I'll say, use unique names. It'll create a second file with a dash one or something next to it. All right, while that's happening, let's take a look at the questions. Um, Stuart has in my desktop looks different than yours. I cannot find the tool that you're using. I don't know which tool that was. Sorry, I'm moving quickly here, but, um, yeah, I don't know which tool it was. Maybe uh, clarify in, a, in another question. Robert Young, can you save a U-point area as a selection? There are no selections in Photolab. You don't have selections like you would have in Photoshop. You would draw a marquee around it. That doesn't exist in here. All adjustments are procedural adjustments. They're all done either through brushes or um, gradients or the U-points, but there is no selection process in here. Uh, alrighty, and let's see here. I'll stop from there and we'll come back to the questions in a bit. So I'm gonna go back to Blue Monday, that first one that I looked at, which had a radically different look to it, but I kind of like it. I just think it really looks kind of neat. It makes the forest a little bit more dark and mysterious instead of that kind of fairy, bright, foggy, airy kind of a look that I had, which is pretty neat, right? The same photo having two dramatically different effects to it. It just depends on your personal mood. And I will, I will say this as well, one of the cool things about the presets, especially the new presets, these new on Vogue presets, they're really, really well designed. And the reason that I like presets is twofold. Now I've been using these plugins pretty much since they were first created almost 15 years ago. I've been using these things for a long time and I still use the presets. And the reasons for this, again, twofold, one of them is for creative inspiration. Quite often, even though I've been a photographer for a really, really long time, quite often I have a photo that I know is a good photo, but I just don't know what direction I wanna take it in. And by opening it into a tool like this and playing with the presets like I am here, I can get inspired to see different things that I wouldn't have normally thought of. And I click there and go, no, 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 ooh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. And this is a great example of that. Two totally different looks from the same tool. Um, I don't know which one I'm gonna like better, but it's a really fun way to explore options and to get creative inspiration. And the second reason that the presets are so awesome is by using the presets as a starting point, you can learn what all the components of the tool does. So for example, here it's Blue Monday. I look over here on the right and I see it's using something called contrast only, cross-processing and photo stylizer. So I can now go in here and kind of reverse engineer this, if you will, and figure out exactly what, or discover, I should say, exactly what each one of these filters is doing. And by doing that, I'll start to learn what the filters actually do. So then when I come in here 
totally from scratch one day and I go, okay, I know what I want. So instead of having to just click through 50 different presets, I'll go straight to the tools that I know that I want to have the look that I'm after. So it's it's just a great way to learn. So inspiration and um, perspiration, no, <laughs> inspiration and just learning what the tools do. So let's see, I'll, I'll turn these off one at a time. So contrast only. Um, okay, it's added a little bit of contrast. It's not doing a whole lot to this image, but there is, you know, I haven't done much in here, so you can certainly add more contrast, but okay. So that's all that's happening there. Cross-processing, let's see what's in this one. This one looks like it's got a little bit more going on. Um, cross-processing has this drop down to show me a lot of different cross-processing methods. Now, if you're not familiar with cross-processing, it's an old film idea where you took film and it was designed to be be processed in one type of chemical and to process it in another. So that's cross-processing. Um, that's what they're doing here. They're simulating cross-processing from negative to positive and from positive to negative, C41 to E6 and E6 to C41. For those of you film heads out there, you know exactly what that means. And I can just run through these different variants of these processes and you'll see as I roll the mouse over it, it updates instantly on the screen. So it's very quick to go through them and try different looks. And I go, oh, I kind of like that one actually. That, that looks pretty neat. So maybe I'll try that one in there. Um, and then there's a strength slider. I can adjust the strength of that of that particular look, but I think it looked pretty good where it was. Okay, and then what else is going on? This photo stylizer. You know what? Photo stylizer, honestly, this is one of those where I go, I don't really understand what's happening, but that's okay. I just go in here and I try different things and see what I think looks interesting. And because I've already played with this one before, I know that the default one for this particular photo I think looks really good. But some of these tools, the reason that I point this out like this is that some of these tools they may never make a whole lot of sense and that's okay if you just know that this tool called photo stylizer does wacky things to your colors that may or may not look good on your photo it can be another cool place to go in and try and try and experiment you have you know your basic contrast and color adjustments and warming filters and all that but you also have a lot of these really kind of kooky creative ones and and combining them together like photo stylizer plus cross-processing can give you some great results but right? if i turn off cross-processing there's the original, which is you know not bad, but cross-processing has done something to the colors that really makes it stand out a bit more. If I turn off photo stylizer, cross-processing now looks completely different. And and that could be great too, right? But you just by combining these, you never know what you're gonna get. And this again comes back to why the presets are so powerful in here. So let's see. So I've been playing with these different tools in here. I'm looking at the image going, okay, this is all good. I kind of like it. Um, but uh, there's something else I want to do to this. So if I look closely, you'll see down here that there's these two red leaves or something. Let's, let me zoom into this to 100%. Um, I'm not quite sure. I guess I think they're leaves. I don't know. But just because of the color processing that's happened, these have become very distracting. There are these two bright red blotches in there. So I want to desaturate the red in here. But I can't just desaturate all the reds because there's a lot of red over here. So I need to isolate it to this. Well, this is where those control points are going to come in really handy again. I'm going to add another filter. So it's added an empty filter holder. And then I will find in here, or we're going to use brilliance and warmth because I know that has a saturation slider in it. And I'm going to desaturate the reds. If I just take the saturation down now, you can see it's desaturating the reds, but obviously it's desaturating everything. So let's not do that quite yet. I need to isolate this tool using the control points. So I'll click on the plus control point here click on the red leaf on there. And this is working just like we saw inside of PhotoLab. And I have a circle here that I can change the size of. And since I'm working with this small leaf, we can isolate it down to there. And before I make any changes, if I wanna see exactly what is going to be affected, I can turn on the mask. And sure enough, there we see the mask that is going to be, uh, that has been created, showing me what is going to be affected in here. Great, so now I can take my saturation down and it's only affecting that red leaf, perfect. Now I also know there's another red leaf over here same thing so what i'll do is instead of recreating everything i'll just option drag this control point to create a new one and drop that control point on top of the other red leaf and once again if i want to verify what is being affected i can do that and you see how as i drag this around the um, the mask gets updated in real time so like there i'd be affecting the green leaves different shades of the green leaves in there but but what i want is just that little red spot right there so there we go, hide the mask. And now I have managed to do that red desaturation on both of those. I'm gonna take it to one more level and I'm gonna take this red in the tree here and do the opposite. I wanna super saturate the red in the tree here. If I zoom out a bit, it's like there's this, like a red sap or something. I don't know, it just looks really kind of cool in there, but I wanna bring that up a bit more. So I'm gonna go ahead and do another brilliance and warmth, the same tool, but I'm going a different direction. I'm gonna saturate instead of desaturate. So I need to add another filter add a new filter in there, go brilliance and warmth again. 
and add another control point. And I'm gonna be pretty precise about where I select that thing. Let's make sure I'm only, oops, only affecting the, that area of the tree. Let's once again, take a look at the mask that's being created. And you can see here, as I move this around, it, it could be very easy to get too much of the wrong part of it. So I am gonna want to be a little bit more precise with this, maybe make this a little bit smaller in here and just affect that area of the tree. Now, if I wanted to, I could protect the other parts of the tree by creating a negative control point and dropping it here to protect those shades of the tree. And see now how the mask is really, really clean. It is only affecting this, uh, what's white in there. I no longer have those gray areas, which would be kind of affected. Let me delete that, that uh, control point. You can see again, so the gray there is gonna be kind of affected, but by adding that negative control point, boom, it totally protects that area. And now it's really going to isolate to those shades of red. So let's hide the mask, take the saturation, crank that all the way up. And you can see how it's just brought that saturation in the red up without affecting any of the green, the tree branches around it. It's very, very precise. Zoom back out again, and there's my final image. So I'll go ahead and save that, and we're gonna call that one done. All right, next photo. We're gonna do something completely different here. Actually, before, let me just take a look at the questions. Um, Robert Hawk says, this is great. You cover a lot of these things on Twitter. If you ask, <laughs> oh, I forgot to tell you, you're asking, you're saying, commenting, there's so much to remember. I forgot to tell you in the beginning, 24 hours after this webinar ends today, you will get an email with a link to a video recording of today's session, assuming that all goes well. So you will have that. So if you miss any of this today or you want to recap any of it, you will have that video in your inbox in just one day. Um, and Craig White says this uh, webinar timing is excellent for Australia. You're welcome. Uh, you know how hard it is to time these things so they work everywhere in the world? It's impossible. So I have multiples of these at different times to hopefully hit everybody, and I'm glad that I caught you. Thank you very much. Okay, next photo. We're going to use this one here. Now, this is um, – you should be wondering what's going on in here. This was shot in Oaxaca, Mexico. This chap is preparing mezcal. It's a, um, a particular tasty beverage, if you like alcoholic beverages. And he is about to throw this thing called a piña. It's a um, – it's basically the big main portion of the agave plant onto a pile of smoldering branches and stuff to essentially smoke this piña. It's kind of cool. Anyway, looking at this photo, it's very flat. I can see that right away. Um, but I can also see that there's a lot of texture in the smoke that I'm sure if I played with a little bit, I could really enhance and really uh, really pull some of that, that texture out of there. Now, to just address the flatness first, I want to stretch out the histogram. If we look at the histogram up here, we can see that my black point, which would be this edge right here, is not being met. So I have I have blank space in my blacks. And same thing on the whites. So my image is a little bit flatter. I want to I want to expand this out. Now I already told you that I love using curves for this sort of thing. So I could I'll try that to start. I'll go into curves, and I'll try this, and I'll kind of pull the shadows down a little bit and pull the highlights up a little bit and Honestly, for this photo, it really ends up not working too well because you can see that all I've really successfully done here is made the uh, his shirt totally black. He's like a silhouette now. Um, I haven't really added any texture into the highlights here, so this is this is really not working. So I'm gonna I'm gonna undo that. Let me just get rid of these control points in there. Uh, actually, I'll just turn this off. Okay. Actually, no, I, I'm gonna need this later, aren't I? So I'm gonna get rid of these points. Come here. Get there. We go. Get, select delete. That's how it works. <laughs> Select it and hit delete. That's how you get rid of the points. Okay, so I'm gonna use a different tool. Now, instead of trying to adjust the highlights and shadows with the curves, I have highlight and shadow sliders, which might work, but there's a single slider, which is actually gonna work even better. And that's this one here called smart lighting. Smart lighting is effectively shadow lifting and highlight recovery and exposure adjustment all in one while the filter is or the slider is analyzing the photo and making sure that none of your darks get too dark and none of your brights get too bright and that the overall image doesn't look too flat it's like a whole lot of things happening at once and all i gotta do is grab one slider and just take it up and see how things look so as i raise this up you can see how we're getting more detail in his shirt and on his face um, we're seeing more of the texture in the in the smoke, they go, it's kind of cool, right? Um, but it has, just because of the nature of this particular photo, it has lifted the shadows a bit too much and it's quite flat looking in there with this weird, like solarized look that I'm not quite digging. So, and if I, if I look at my histogram here, we'll see I've, I've actually raised the black point considerably. So now I'm gonna 
now that it's kind of compressed like that, I'm actually going to restretch it out using the curves. And this time, instead of adding a, an actual curve to it, I'm simply going to grab the black point and pull that in a little bit. And if you're watching the histogram here, you'll see how the bottom of this curve moved over here. Let me repeat that again. So keep an eye on that histogram. As I move the curve point, I move my black point closer to pure black, and I'll do the same thing with white. I'll move my white point closer to pure white. And now I have that higher contrast in the image that I wanted while simultaneously pulling up the shadows and pulling down the highlights. So now we've got something that's a bit closer to what I want to do. Um, unfortunately, the, the color on his skin has gone a little bit weird. It's kind of like a bit extra orange or something, which I don't like. So I'm going to go to my hue, saturation, and lightness adjustment, the tool that I couldn't find earlier. And I'm going to lower the saturation, but not on all colors, just on the reds. It, I could use control points for this as well, but since the only reds in this scene are his skin tones, I'm not going to bother with control points. I'll just take the saturation on the reds, pull them down just a little bit. It's going to pull some of that out and yeah, that looks better already. Okay, so that's where we're gonna leave that. So that's cool, I'm liking that. Um, I'm gonna add one more slider in here before we take it into a filter, and that is using the micro contrast. So you have a contrast slider here, standard contrast, but then micro contrast is kind of like structure. You may have, you know, depending on what tools you're using, structure is something you've probably heard before. A um, micro contrast is similar to that in that it's adding contrast to the fine details in the midtones. So if I crank this all the way up, you see it does like wild things and the smoke gets, really weird and modeled, but you can see like every little molecule of smoke in there pretty much. It has done very HDR-ish looking things to him. So that's way over the top, but I also cranked it all the way up to 11. So let me just pull this down and I'll find a, a happy medium here where I'm getting some of that texture in the smoke that I think looks really cool. And it's, it's adding a bit of nice texture to his shirt, which makes it pop a little bit without getting too carried away in there. So yeah, I think that's what I'm gonna do there. I'm gonna use that one. All right, um, now let's take this into a filter. And now I'm going to choose the filter Analog Effects Pro. So Analog Effects Pro, if you've never seen this, is all about giving kind of a film look, an old school analog, hence the name, uh, look to the image. Let me also open the questions and see what's going on over there. Um, Brian Batley is saying, I have a DNG, if I have a DNG file from Lightroom, can I use a Nick plugin on it? I'm pretty sure you can. Someone had asked before about DNG support and I wasn't sure, but I don't see why it wouldn't work. If you're in Lightroom and you send a file to Nick, it's going to convert it to a TIFF first, so that will definitely work. If you're trying to do the open in Photoshop as a smart object method of working, then I, I'm not totally sure you'll have to try it out. Um, and incidentally, this is a good time for me to point this out too. So if you are using Lightroom Classic and Photoshop as your solution, you have essentially the same thing we have here. You have the option to send the filter to the plugins where it will render out a TIFF, open in the plugin. Anything you do in there is destructive. It's permanent to that TIFF. You hit save and you come back. Your raw file is still intact. Don't worry. But you have permanently altered that TIFF file. And there's no way to go back to it and make a subtle change to the work that you'd already done. However, from Photoshop, and this is one of the advantages of using Photoshop, uh, well, or Lightroom Classic with Photoshop, is you can open a file, a raw file, as a smart object in Photoshop. You can either from Photoshop or Adobe Camera Raw technically open the raw file, make adjustments to the raw file, open it as a smart object, or you can be in Lightroom Classic, make your adjustments, and then uh, choose send to Photoshop as smart object. When you have a smart object in Photoshop, when you apply a filter to it, it gets applied as a smart filter. And a smart filter is a filter you can go back and re-edit at any time. So that is your most flexible workflow uh, but it does require having the Adobe subscription. So just throwing it out there, if you've got the tools, that's something else to look for. Okay, uh, back into the tools. So once again, I'm going to start with presets. The nice thing about the Analog Effects Pro presets is we see what it's gonna look like over here on the left. So as I scroll down through them, you get all these different previews of what they're gonna look like. And I'm right now in the classic camera presets. These aren't even the new ones, um, but we're gonna get into the new ones here. So I click on this thing at the top. I see all these different tool combinations. And see, these are broken into, into different categories that are based off of a camera type. And I'm doing air quotes because, you know, it's all fake anyway, but it's like wet plate photography, subtle bokeh, toy camera, vintage camera, all these different ones. And then there's on Vogue, the new categories. And if we look through these, once again, you can see a preset on the left. I see that thumbnail before you can apply it. Click apply, it takes a moment because these are pretty intensive and you see exactly what it looks like. But I love that we have these presets on the left that we can just uh, we can just you know click and play, click on them and play with them and, uh, and see what we get. Now, this is all fun and well, 
clicking through all these random ones in here, but let's say you go through all the presets and you just still aren't finding anything that really floats your boat. Well, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll see this button that says, I'm feeling lucky. <laughs> this is kind of cool because you click on this and it just randomizes everything. It just gives you a bunch of random looks on here. And every time you click it, it does something else. And so you might do this and find some stuff that you think is super awesome. You might find some of them are totally ridiculous, um, but it's just this neat thing that you have. I'll do one more. Um, you just click on feeling lucky and you get some random look in there, which I totally dig. Okay, that, was, that one's really dark, but but okay, cool, right? And then I can go into these presets, uh, into the adjustments here and start playing with them. Like this Boca one has like blur strength controls. I can change the position of what's what should be in focus. It just kind of got lucky at position right over this chap here. Um, how, how much of the photo do I want to be in focus or not? Um, really neat things we can do in here. Let's see, let's go for like a light leak control in here. Um, add light leaks over the picture. There's just a ton of different things that we can play with in here to give these different looks. I just, I love, love Analog Effects Pro for that. I'm gonna, I like this one. I'm gonna hit okay and just save that and call it a day. Um, but again, you can do so much in here if you want to. We're gonna come back into, into Analog Effects Pro and do something a little bit more manually in a moment here. Um, Robert Hawks, this is great. Do you cover a lot of these ideas on your Twitter account? Oh, you already answered that, sorry. Um, uh, Doyle cannot see my editing screen. Sorry, Doyle, um, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Everybody else is seeing it, so you gotta find the button in your interface to do that. Um, Steven Spence, can you stack similar photos like you can in Lightroom? Oh, um, no, there is no stacking function. Um, I know what you mean there, no, there is no stacking function. Can you do anything with infrared, Amy Nelson asks. There's, if you mean make it look like infrared, there are filters, I think, in ColorFX Pro that simulate an infrared look. If you mean take an infrared photo with taken on an infrared uh, converted camera, you can absolutely edit that in here. Those files aren't any different than any other raw file. So I don't know if there's any presets to do specific things that are designed for infrared, but you can certainly do anything that you want to that infrared file. Um, an infrared file is not any different than one that's not infrared. It's the camera sensor that was altered. And yeah, that, that's basically all there is to it. Uh, okay, let's see here. Let me go on here to the next. What was I gonna do next? Um, next one is the portrait. Yes, let's load up this girl here. And this picture, um, while this is loading here, you may notice if you look closely in the bottom left corner here, that there's an icon in here that has a camera with a little triangle on it, a little warning triangle that is missing from this raw file, this raw file, and this raw file. So here's something to understand about Photolab. Every file that you open in Photolab gets a matching profile. A profile is a camera and lens combination specific profile that does things like a distortion correction, chromatic aberration correction, um, adjusting for inherent softness in a lens, there's a few other things that it does. Uh, just that I say distortion correction if it's a really wide angle lens, that the software applies automatically. It's an automatic correction for that particular camera and lens combination. And when you think about it, there are literally thousands of camera and lens combinations out there. Now, that doesn't mean there's a file for absolutely every camera and lens combination on the planet. However, pretty much all of the common cameras from the major manufacturers and all of their lenses, you're going to find a camera combination too. And when you first load a photo in Photolab, that you've never looked at before, a combination you've never looked at before, it'll pop up a little dialogue that says, oh, you need to download the color of the profile for this camera. It'll tell you this camera and this lens. You click one button and it does it and applies it. It takes a few seconds. They're, they're tiny little files. Um, but that happens the first time you do it. So that's why these raw files do not have that dialogue. These are TIFF files. It's telling you that it's not applying a correction to it because it's a TIFF. It's already been applied. But over here, this one's got a triangle on it. So it's a warning sign. Why is that work? Why is that happening? Well, you see, if you can see the dialogue pop up there, it says no DxO optics module is available for this image. The reason for that is because the lens that I used on this camera is an old mechanical lens that has no communication to the camera. So the camera doesn't know what the lens is, therefore the software doesn't know. So all this means is that if there's any distortion or chromatic aberration that needs to be done, I'm gonna have to do it by hand. Um, that's what that dialogue means. So if you see that, that's why. Now, in this case, there's nothing like that that needs to be done. Um, the photo is looking pretty clean as it is, and I'm just gonna jump straight into a filter, but first I'm gonna do a little bit of basic retouching in here. So I'm gonna zoom into her face, and again, I'm gonna use this uh, retouching tool, which like I said, not super advanced, but you know, it, it'll get the job done. So we'll just get rid of some of these spots on here. And if I show the masks while I do this, you can see everywhere that I'm painting on, and you can kind of see the, um, the healing masks that are being drawn. And then when I turn it off, 
hide that, you'll see the results. So it's just a super straightforward, super simple kind of effect. All right, let's close that and jump into Analog Effects Pro. Let's jump back into the questions while that's happening. Um, Junebug is asking me to use Mouse Pose by Boink Software to highlight your pointer and keystrokes. Okay, I will try that next time. Um, I'll, I'm gonna write that down because I have not played with that before. Mouse Pose by Boinks. Okay, sure, thanks. Um, I made the screen lower resolution so everything's bigger in the hopes that it'll be easier to see everything, but I will absolutely take that under advisement. Antonio from Portugal says, it's late evening there. When it's not just, uh, sorry, that was Spanish. Can you please show an example of wildlife photography editing? I'll get there. I have a wildlife photo at the end. It's my last photo. Okay. Um, what am I doing here? So I am going to, oh yeah, I'm going to play with a bunch of presets here, but for this photo, I have an idea of what I want. So this is, this is the type of process where I'm coming in with an idea of what I want. And so I could create it from scratch or because I love using the presets so much, I'm just going to play with a bunch of presets and see if I can find a good starting point and then take it from there. So for example, you know, I might just go in here and we'll start with the on Vogue presets and I scroll through these and oh, then the look that I want is kind of a, a summery, warm with a lens flare kind of a look. Why not? Right. That's what I'm going for. So I'm going to look through these and, and none of these really quite match that. Nope, 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 nope. Okay. Those aren't any good for what I want. Um, I don't let's try vintage camera, go through these and there's still no kind of summary look in there and let's go to classic camera and scroll through these and classic camera too. We're, we're getting closer. Like this is kind of not really, but kind of, uh, classic camera five. This is kind of nice. So, okay, great. So I find this as a starting point. I go, yeah, this is a starting point. Um, too saturated, a little bit too saturated. So let me pull that down. Maybe I need to add another adjustment to here. Maybe I don't. Let's just see what's in here already. We've got a film type, a lens vignette, dirt and scratches and a basic adjustment. Mm, basic adjustment sounds promising. Go into there. Sure enough, there's a saturation slider. It's cranked way up. So let's pull that down a little bit. Make that look a little bit more natural and um, and realistic in there. So I'm going to do that. Now I want to add um, I want to add another filter. I want some light leaks to happen on this. I wanted that kind of lens flare light leaks. So the way that this works is a little bit odd, and I'm going to show you how to do it incorrectly so that I can show you how to do it correctly. It's worth pointing out that these tools, the original Nick plugins from the original company, were designed over the course of many, many years. And as a new filter came out, they changed how things worked a little bit. So there's not, it's a bit unfortunate, but there's not a lot of consistency between the tools in how you apply things. Um, each one's got a little bit of uniqueness to it. It takes a little getting used to, but you know, you figure it out. But in this case, what I'm leading up to is, let's say that I want to add one of these tools in here. So I look over here and I go, um, light leaks, right? It says right here, light leaks. So I click on that and look what happened. It just got rid of everything else that I had done. All my other work is now done. I've just replaced everything with a light leak. Not what I wanted to do. So I'm going to hit undo, get back to where I was. And the way that you have to do this is I was in this position. I was in this classic camera preview. I have to go into the camera kit mode where it says build a camera. And that now shows me these tools where Again, if I just click on it, it's just going to replace everything. But notice as I roll my mouse over each one of these that there's a little plus that shows up. You have to click that little plus to add the filter. I know it's kind of weird, but it's just the way it is. So I've just added light leaks into this. Great. So now I've got light leaks and now I can go through here and I can just try these different presets in here, um, try these different light leaks. And if I want to reposition one, let's get something a bit more bold. I can reposition that light leak in here. I can change the intensity, the strength of that light leak. Um, on there, I can choose from different categories. There's soft and crisp and all these different categories in here of light leaks. And so you just find something that looks good. And, and I'm going to go for something, you know, kind of lens flourish. Actually, that's kind of cool like that. Pull that back in a little bit. There we go. Kind of like that. Kind of dig it. Maybe take the intensity down a little bit. It's just one of those things that you can do. Uh, maybe I want to add a frame to this. So let's go in here and add a frame. So I'm going to go back to the camera kit and, um, what am I looking for? Uh, where's the frames? Let's just go do, 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 do. frames. Here it is. Click on the frames one. It is adding the frames to that. So there we go. Now I've got all these different camera frames. So you got film strips, um, simple white frames, a light box frames. Actually, I kind of like these light box ones. You have some really kind of cool, cool frame edges. Some of these are pretty hefty and they take a moment to apply. Also, it's worth pointing out that my system I'm demoing on today is actually quite old. It's like a 2015 or maybe 2014 iMac. So, um, not the latest and greatest hardware at all. Uh, 
Well, that's kind of neat. Actually, I quite like that one. That's kind of cool right there. So again, all these different presets in here that you can play with. Uh, maybe I want to add some green to it, give it a little more of a grainy look to it. So if I look in film type, I know that there's green in here. It's kind of an interesting thing about green. The higher the number, the lower the grain. You think, well, hold on a second, that doesn't make sense. If you read this, it actually does. It's green per pixel. So the higher the number, that's more grain per pixel, which means smaller grain, which means less visible grain. So if I take this and I bring it way down to a really low number, then we get this really hard grainy image. If you take it all the way down to one, it's this crazy, really grainy, um, not exactly even realistic at this point look. But if I then take that grain per pixel and I find a happy medium in there, we can get a very beautiful, very realistic grain look to it. The key in here is just to not overdo it. That's really the key to make to making realistic looking grain. And um, you know that looks pretty good. Incidentally as well, just a little tip, if you are playing with grain, um, good idea to check how it looks at your final output size. Like right now I'm looking at this at one to one and this is a 20, for whatever megapixel file. If I was gonna put this on, say, Instagram, it's only gonna be 1,080 pixels wide, all the grain I see here would pretty much be lost. It'd be like a little bit of texture, but not much. If I want that grain to be more visible at that small size, I'm probably gonna have to really overdo it at this size. And then when I render out the smaller version, it will look better. So that's just one of those things to keep in mind. Okay, uh, anyway, so that's the kind of thing you can do. Lots of different stuff to do into this to uh, to play with the look of your image and make it look kind of cool. I'm gonna save that one and we're gonna do another effect. We're gonna do a black and white look to the same photo to do something completely different. Um, let's see here, Sil is saying you have a photo video lag but not me as the speaker. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know how to help with that, sorry. It might be an internet connection thing. Um, Fabian says, they said NIC2 has raw support, so it should be able to open the DNG. What that means is it's not the NIC plugins, it's NIC2 as the collection has raw support, which is what Photolab is. Photolab has the raw support. So Photolab does work with DNGs, as far as I know. I don't I don't convert to DNG. Um, it must, because the camera, remember DxO made that camera for a while, the, um, the one, that shot DNG files. So it must read DNGs. I mean, it has to, it's totally universal. Um, I just don't ever work with DNGs, sorry. Okay. Moving on, I'm going to take the same photo. Let's zoom back out. Um, the original one, yeah. So there's there's the one that I just created, right? Looking cool and analogy. Uh, I'm going to take this one, and we're going to take this into the world of black and white. Silverfix Pro. Here we go. Oop. And again, use unique names. Now, if you have never worked with Silverfix Pro before, you're in for a treat. Silverfix Pro is without a doubt my favorite black and white conversion tool. I've been using, again, this software specifically, Nick SilverFX Pro, for a really long time. I love it. I have done entire gallery shows printing huge prints where everything was processed through SilverFX Pro. And in this one, I'm not gonna go through the presets. You can do that on your own time. I wanna show you something incredibly powerful about SilverFX Pro that is what makes this thing so awesome. So we're gonna kinda go all the way up to the edge of the highest level of learning about this app. I'm gonna show you something in here that is incredibly powerful. Have you, you don't have to answer this in the chat, but have you ever heard of something called the zone system? Now the zone system, for those who don't know, was developed by Ansel Adams. And the idea behind the zone system is every black and white image is broken into 11 zones from zero to 10. Every zone has a particular type of data that belongs in that zone. Skin tone has a particular range. Snow has a particular range. Dark shadows have a particular range. And if you understand where things go and you can measure the zones and put things in the right zone as defined by Ansel back in the day, then when you print this image, it will look amazing. And I can attest to that, again, by having done major huge gallery prints with it and they look incredible. And if you, aren't familiar with um, what the zones are, let me show you how to find that. If you go to Wikipedia and you just search for zone system in Wikipedia, scroll down the page and you're gonna find this description. And this description describes zero through 10. Zero is pure black, pretty self-explanatory. Let's go all the way up to 10, pure white, obvious, right? But it, highlight, it calls out what that really means, light sources and specular reflections. So this would be, let's say you have an actual light source, a light bulb in the image that would be so bright that you'd hit zone 10. You have a highlight off of the chrome bumper of a car. That's a specular reflection. That belongs in zone 10. Okay, what about zone nine? 
Zone 9, slight tone without texture, glaring snow. So glaring snow is not even – without texture is not even as bright as the brightest thing could be. It's zone 10. This is just zone 9. Go down to zone 8. What's in here? Lightest tone with texture, textured snow. So if you're going to photograph snow and you want to see the texture in the snow, that needs to go all the way down to zone 8, which seems kind of dark. But when you go to print it, that's what's going to look right. Then we get down to zone 7, and this is the first one where we see skin, and it's highlighting very light skin. Now, the model here that I photographed has quite light skin, so we can assume that some of her skin belongs in zone 7. Zone 6 is average Caucasian skin, and it goes into more details down and down and down. Okay, so let's go back over to this photo. I am going to start with – I'm just going to go to basic neutral preset, so nothing has been applied to this image. No, no effects have been applied to it. Over here on the right, I've got brightness, contrast, structure, selective adjustments, all these kind of film looks and all this kind of stuff in here. But I want to focus on my zones. If you go down to the very bottom, there's this thing that says loop and histogram. Open that up, and if I look at the histogram – I see the histo on there. Um, loop will allow me to zoom into the image. But it doesn't really matter – oops, it doesn't matter which one I'm on here. What matters is what's on the bottom. See this row of numbers from 0 through 10? Those are the zones, and you notice how as I put my mouse over any zone, it highlights on screen with the little red hashes or little whatever colored hashes um, showing what is in that zone. So what I can do now is I – remember, I haven't done anything to the image yet. In fact, let, let me do this. I'm going to go up and increase the exposure because at first glance, I might think, yeah, this picture is a little bit dark. I want to brighten it up a little bit. So let's brighten it up. Well, maybe not the shadows. Let's, let's not do it that way. Let's do it this way. Let me take the – uh, open up the brightness, get into the more controls. I'll take the highlights up, really brighten up her skin. I can take the shadows down, really darken the background there, and go, okay, yeah, I, I think this looks good. So now I go to my zones, and let's see. So I look at zone 10, and nothing is showing up in zone 10, so that's good, right? Now I have no specular highlights in here. Let's look at zone 9. Whoa, well, hold on a second. In zone 9, I'm already getting to see the tip of her nose, her forehead, the top of her hand up here. All of those have hashes on them, so that tells me that that part of her skin is as bright as glaring textureless snow. So that's not good. That is not going to print well. That's not going to look good at all. Go down to zone 8. Zone 8, I think it's zone 8 I'm not even supposed to be in, right? Let me go back and check. Zone 8 was the lightest tone with texture. I need to get to 7 before I really should have skin. So there's all this stuff in zone 8 and zone 9 that I need to pull back. So instead of having to make an adjustment and then roll your mouse back, back, roll your mouse back here to compare it, what I can do is click on these zones, and that locks them in. And so now I've locked in zones 8, 9, and 10, so they're on permanently. So now I'm going to go up to my exposure, and we'll pull the highlights down until we get rid of those hashes so we know nothing is in that zone. And if I start getting the other skin too dark, so before I finish this, I'm going to go in and turn off those 8, 9, and 10, and let's look at 7 and 6. Those are where I want most of our skin to be. And we're, we're there. We're doing good. Um, I don't want it to go too dark. Like five on skin might be getting a little bit too dark. It's on the shadow, so we're probably okay. Um, and four, we're pretty much off the skin, so I think we're good there. But if I go back to eight, nine, and ten, I still do have some highlights on her nose in there that I don't want. So now I'm going to use the U points to control this area. So I'll go in here to selective adjustments, grab a control point, drop this on the tip of her nose here. It is just going to isolate her nose. We can check exactly what's being selected in there. So you can see there it is really primarily on the nose right there. And now as I pull the um, the highlights down on that nose, we can recover that back. There we go and get rid of all of that overly bright area. Perfect. So you can see how this works, right? It takes time. It really does take time to get this right. But you do this right and you will have a beautiful image that will print gorgeously. All right, that's what I wanted to show you in here. Last one we're going to play with is a wildlife image. And for this one, I've got this lovely photo of a giraffe. Just like I love this shot. Uh, this photo, I don't want to do any crazy weird look. Like this is just a beautiful photo that maybe needs some exposure correction and, and that sort of thing. So um, I can do this all in in uh, photo lab or I could take it into Viveza or one of the other tools to do. Uh, I think what I'll do is I'll do some basic correction here and then we'll jump into ColorFX Pro and see if there's something just a little bit extra that can be added to it that'll make it look a little better. Um, I think all I really want to do is stretch out the image. The highlights, well actually the highlights looking pretty good there. You know what, let's do this. Let's bring up his eyes. His eyes are a little on the dark side. Let's go to local adjustments, um, drop a control point over his eye on there. Let's make sure that it is just selecting his eye. There we go. And I'll pull the exposure up a little bit on that. There we go. Just a little. 
just to add a little bit more light into there. I'm going to add another one over here. Now, this um, this control point, the second control point that I added, is automatically part of this group. So anything I do here is affecting both of those control point areas. So that's really good to know as well. So I'm just going to bring up the exposure just a little bit on there. Okay. That's all I'm going to do there. Let's, let's take it into the plugin. Let's go into ColorFX Pro 4 because I want to do gentle color work and a little gentle creative color work. I don't want to go crazy. I'm not going to make this look like some old film thing. And let's see what I can get out of it. While that's rendering, ooh, we just have four minutes left. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, oh, oh, this is probably way too late, but somebody is advising whoever it was on the phone to slide your screen on the phone. Hopefully you figured it out by now. Um, Blair says, is there a particular NIC collection of filters for black and white, including sapia effects? So that would be inside of SilverFX Pro. There are some sapia presets in there that you can play with for sure. Craig White, yes, I edit from DNG and then DXO1 with no issues and PhotoLab works well. Thank you very much, Craig, for confirming that. Ray Nickel, on the image of the model, after applying grain and then you decide to retouch out the hair across her nostril, okay, will the grain be accurately duplicated in the retouched area? Well, that's a great question. So because in this workflow, no. If you hit OK and rendered out the TIFF and then decided, oh, I wanted to get rid of that hair and you started to retouch it, it – I haven't tried it. It might do a good job of retouching it out. It might not, but it is not going to respect the original grain application. It's completely departed from that, right? We're no longer in that space. If, however, you were using Photoshop with the smart object and the smart filter, you could go back into that original raw file, do the retouching at the raw level, and then it would cascade through to show the final processed result. It basically reprocesses the image with the new data underneath, which is really, really cool. Um, what happened? Did it, did it not load? Oh, no, there it is. Okay. Let's go into the recipes. And once again in here, I can just click through different recipes, try different looks in here. That's really not any good. Um, even on a, actually it looks kind of good on there. And so this is a nice thing where it's not some crazy creative effect in here. It is slight color shifts, some of which will look better than others. Um, that actually looks kind of good in there. It's kind of a muted color in there. Um, super punch. That's a bit too much in there. Soft mute. Um, actually, I don't like soft mute on this one. I loved it on the trees. Don't like it here. Clarity bump. Pretty subtle, but nice, right? There's a. We can do a little before and after on there. It's very, very subtle, but it's added that extra bump of texture in there. Kind of. Yeah, kind of liked. Which one was it that I liked? Red rocks, lavender. I don't know. They all look pretty good. Actually, this is even on a cloudy day. Looks pretty good in there. So, again, not a massively creative look to it, but. For this one, that's yeah, too much. I'm going to go back to Clarity Bump. I like that one the best. Um, I think it looks pretty good. Let's add a little bit more. You know what? Let's do this. Let's, let's, I've got two minutes. Let's do a little bit more. I'm going to darken the green background over there by using, um, using control points. So let's do this. Add another filter. And what filter do I want to use? Um, contrast. No. Crossbar. Darken light and center. No. Dark contrast. So dark contrast might work. Let's see what that does. Uh, Probably a little bit too much, but I'm going to apply this only to the background in here. And I'm not even going to look at the mask. I just cried one of the background. Let's do another mask there, another one here, make that a little bit bigger. And very quickly, I have isolated those areas there. Let's take the dark detail extractor, slider down a little bit, maybe adjust the brightness a little, add a little more contrast in there. And just like that, and even crank the saturation up and pull a little bit of green into those blacks in there. And without having to even look at the masks, I've managed to do that. Now, if I want to look at the masks, of course I can, all right? So I go in here and I go, let's take a look at the masks in there, turn all three of them on and we see what's being affected. And at this point I go, oh, well, look, I've actually kind of affected some areas that I don't want. So let's um, let's add a negative control point. Let's just drop a protective point onto there. And I'm going to option drag these around to affect different parts of the image. And so I'm creating multiple negative control points in here to separate all of that out. Is that another one there? There we go, that's pretty good. And now I could also go in here and add more positive control points. I'm just option dragging these, it's all I'm doing. Let's add another one up there. And look at how quickly I am building a very accurate mask around our friend the giraffe. Protect another area there, protect another area there, protect another area there. It's, it works out pretty well, pretty quickly. Let's see, we'll add one more, I'll do it like that. There we go. There's my, oh, it looks like I need another one here now. Find that. Good enough. Okay. All these control points that I've added. Let's hide all of those. 
and there's the end result. And again, I can go in here and adjust the brightness and that is largely affecting just the background in there. And it took mere seconds to put all that together. So very, very powerful. I kind of like that one. I'm going to save that one. And that's it. That is all there is to it. Let me see if there's any last questions. Otherwise, I'm out of here. John Mortar, I recently learned that holding down shift while pressing save recipe within color effects will save control points for the current image, which can then be saved as a next sidecar.np file. That sounds very familiar. I'd completely forgotten about that. Thereby allowing one to come back later and rework the same image. I'm going to add that into my demo. I, you know, you're right. I, I totally forgot about that. Um, add shift and see. Yeah, that's a great tip. Thank you. And I am 99% sure that you are accurate because that does sound like something I learned a long time ago. Thank you, John, for sharing that with me. Craig White, thank you. Would love to show more before and after comparisons in future webinars. Um, okay, well, I, I'll just I'll I'll make a point to make sure I go back and forth between them a little bit more or hit the before and after while I'm in there. Thank you for the feedback. Blair says, awesome. Thank you. You are quite welcome. And that is the last one. All right. Look at that. Oh, one minute over. Went over today. All right, you guys. Hey, thanks a bunch for tuning in. Again, you are going to get a copy of this video in your inbox in just 24 hours. It'll show up automatically. And um, if you have any questions that I didn't get a chance to get to or you think of later, just hit me on Twitter, at PhotoJoseph on Twitter. Uh, please follow me on Twitter, Instagram, it's all PhotoJoseph, and YouTube. I do a ton of tutorials and videos that are free on YouTube. Check those out, youtube.com slash PhotoJoseph. And stop on my website, PhotoJoseph.com, where all the video tutorials get dumped as well. So you have some other sorting tools in there, as well as some other written tips that go on there too. So yeah, photo just everywhere. Thanks a bunch, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's session, and I'll see you possibly at another one at another time. Later.